Diabetes has emerged as one of the biggest health problems in Minnesota. It is estimated that nearly 10% of Minnesota adults have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, around one in four people with diabetes do not know that they have the disease, which keeps them from getting appropriate treatment. Diabetes is also a major reason why healthcare costs are so high and rising rapidly. Costs related to medical treatment of diabetes are expected to rise rapidly in Minnesota from $3.3 billion today to $6.4 billion in 2025. Given the significance of diabetes on the overall health of Minnesota, we're going to look at diabetes on today's episode of a Public Health Journal. And given the fact that diabetes has impacted almost every family in the state, I encourage you to stay tuned. Welcome to a Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to A Public Health Journal. Today we're going to look at the problem of diabetes in Minnesota. Diabetes is a disease that impacts nearly 1 in 10 Minnesotans and contributes significantly to health care costs in our state. As part of our conversation, we'll be looking at ways to prevent the occurrence of diabetes and how to deal with it once it occurs. Joining me in this discussion is Gretchen Taylor, supervisor of the diabetes unit at the Minnesota Department of Health. In that role, she works with staff and partners to prevent type 2 diabetes, improve health for people with diabetes, and reduce diabetes-related disparities. Gretchen, welcome to our program. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, thank you for, for being here to talk about really a major problem in our state. And, I, and I'm not sure people recognize how big of a problem it is, but let's start really at the beginning. What is diabetes? Okay, so diabetes, there are two main types of diabetes. Uh, type one diabetes is much smaller proportion of the population. Those are people, about 5% of people, total people with diabetes who their um, pancreas stops producing insulin and insulin is needed to take glucose out of the blood and into the cells to use for fuel. So without this, uh, blood glucose levels rise and uh, it becomes very, very serious. So a person with type 1 diabetes needs to take insulin by injection or a pump for the rest of their lives. And this used to be called um, childhood diabetes. And because most people who develop it do develop it during childhood or adolescence, um, but it, it can occur at any time in a person's life. So that's 5% of diabetes. Second type of diabetes is 95%, and that's type 2 diabetes. This is the type of diabetes that also is related to blood glucose levels. But here, the problem with the pancreas is a little bit different. The pancreas slows down its production of insulin or becomes, uh, the body becomes resistant to the insulin that is produced. And so there again, you get a buildup of glucose and that causes all kinds of damage in the body. So a person with type two diabetes also needs to take medication to uh, allow the cells to use um, the, the glucose in the blood uh, for all of the activities that the body performs. Mm -hmm. So 95% of the people with diabetes are type two. Mostly this develops in adulthood, but there are, we are seeing that um, adolescents, some adolescents are developing type 2 diabetes. And as I said, this is the one that um, is possible to either prevent or delay. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I know that in, in my medical training now, many, many decades ago mm -hmm. in medical school, type 2 diabetes was a relatively small problem. Type 1 diabetes, juvenile diabetes, as mm -hmm. we called it back then, was the, the biggest issue. And type 2 was sort of an, an anomaly. But now I understand that type 2 diabetes is really, really a major problem. As you say, 95% of the disease. And I've got a slide here that shows the increasing prevalence, you know, how many people in our society have it. And so explain a little bit what's going on with this slide about the increasing prevalence and what that means in terms of the number of people infected. Okay, so over the last 20 years, um, diabetes has continued to rise. You can see it on the slide. Uh, in 1995, there were about 3.5% of uh, uh, Minnesotans that had diabetes, and now it's at 8%. And um, so over the course of the last 20 years, it's, it's more than doubled. 
and um, when we add in the people who don't know yet that they have diabetes, the 25% of people, it's now at really 10% of people, ha um, of, a, of a Minnesotans have diabetes, one type or the other. And that translates into about 340,000 plus uh, Minnesotans, so it's a big number and about 18,000 new cases of diabetes are diagnosed each year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we talk about the, the pre-diabetes. So let's take a look at this next slide and uh, we can, can show sort of for the, the audience sort of what we're talking about that, you know, pre-diabetes where people who don't know they have it sort of under the surface. Tell us, you know, explain what pre-diabetes is. Okay, so one of the big drivers for the diabetes epidemic is that um, CDC estimates um, based on surveys that they do of actually measuring blood glucose and doing dietary surveys and such, that one in three adults has um, prediabetes. And that is a condition where blood glucose, you know, goes from normal and it's a continuum. It, it can go uh, be above normal between 100 and 124 milligrams per deciliter and that's called prediabetes. And then when it gets to be 125 and above, it's classified as diabetes. Mm -hmm. So it's a continuum of normal to prediabetes to diabetes. And um, we have one in every three adult Minnesotans have prediabetes, which without any intervention, if they do nothing, um, they will, 15 to 30% will develop type 2 diabetes within five years. All right, so people with prediabetes, they don't have any symptoms generally. They don't feel no, sick, they, uh, but they have risk factors, which we'll talk about a little bit. But right. then when you eat diabetes, then you all, all of a sudden realize you start getting symptoms, you start having some, some health problems that are related to it. Right, but even in the prediabetes phase, people with prediabetes are certainly at increase for getting type 2 diabetes, but they're also at increased risk for heart disease and stroke, even in that um, somewhat elevated blood glucose level range. So, so it's a real problem. A another big problem is that uh, in Minnesota, while we estimate that about 37% have prediabetes, only 6% have been told that they have prediabetes. So um, there isn't as big an awareness among our physicians yet to know that they should be testing people, anybody over 45, or uh, populations of color in American Indians should be tested earlier, and, and because this is a phase when you can do something about it. All right, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we identify it and how do you intervene, but first we need to take a little break. Okay. We'll be back right after this message. Well, Thomas, you've got prediabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have prediabetes. Big time. Welcome back. We're talking about diabetes in Minnesota with Gretchen Taylor from the Minnesota Department of Health Diabetes Unit. Gretchen, one of the why is diabetes a concern? What are the problems that diabetes cause? I think we really need to understand. You mentioned a little bit about it. It's linked to heart disease, but what are some of the problems that diabetes itself causes? Okay, so people with diabetes do have higher risk for having heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. They also have increased risk for kidney disease, um, a lot of people who end up on dialysis have diabetes, so they get kidney disease, they get kidney failure, they need to be on dialysis. Uh, it also affects the, mass, the microvascular system, the small blood vessels, so that affects the eyes, causes eye disease, can lead to blindness. Um, it affects the blood flow in the feet and the extremities, so it can lead to amputations of the toe, of the foot, even of the, the lower leg. So it's really uh, has, aside from just having diabetes itself, it, it then comes along with many of these complications. 
and so it um, is, it's, you know, it's something that the person with diabetes needs to manage every day, um, everything, you know, every meal, they need to be thinking about it, how active they are, they need to be thinking about that. They need to get to the doctor more, they need medications, so all of that uh, adds complexity to their lives, um, but it really also affects healthcare costs in our state. Right, so it must be a really an expensive disease. It's very expensive for the person and for society. Um, in, in 2012, the one report uh, said that the total spending for insured Minnesotans with diabetes was $5.2 billion, uh, to, but to bring it down to a more a level that we can more understand, uh, another large health insurance uh, company based here in, in Minnesota uh, reported in 2012 that for the average person, the medical cost for a person without diabetes was about 4700 a year. For a person with diabetes, it was 11700 yeah, So over double, almost three times the cost right. if you've got diabetes. And a person with diabetes and complications, their, the cost was 20000 mm. So you can just see that it's extremely expensive to to manage and to treat and for the healthcare system as we see this big bolus of people who have prediabetes without action you know we're going to see greater in increases in the population with diabetes and the healthcare costs in the okay. state so so the the number of people with diabetes are rising why is that happening why did this start occurring you know 20 years ago we started to see this big rise and why is it continuing to occur okay so a big reason that type 2 diabetes is increasing is that um, we have more overweight and obesity in our population, less physical activity. And those are two uh, really strong risk factors for increasing blood glucose levels. So as we know, uh, right now, two out of every three adults in Minnesota is overweight or obese, two out of three. And so, and children, of course, are also um, getting overweight and obese at younger ages and maintaining that into adulthood. So that's one of the big drivers is uh, those maps that show uh, the percentage of people with, uh, who are overweight or obese have, inc have increased. We see those rates increasing and diabetes has increased right along with So they it. go hand in glove. If you're overweight, you're more likely to become, have uh, type two diabetes or develop type two diabetes. Right. And then we also know that our population is aging and people are at higher risk for type two diabetes as they get older. So 65% uh, of, uh, no, 20% of 65 year olds have type two diabetes, whereas 4% of those 18 to 24 have type, you know, have diabetes at all. Uh, the other figure was also for diabetes in general. And then in the middle, it's about like 45 to 64, it's about 9% of people. So you see the steady increase with age in abnormal blood glucose leading into di diabetes. And our population is becoming more diverse and populations of color in American Indians have higher prevalence of diabetes than do non-Hispanic whites. Mm -hmm. So why, why is that? What's, what's the, why is the racial differences in, in diabetes? Do, do we know? I don't think that we really do know. We know that American Indians have about twice the prevalence of diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. Um, African Americans are, are are near that, um, Hispanic, Latino, and then Asian Americans, but they all have higher rates of type two diabetes, and I, I'm not sure that we really know. Well, I know, you know, the department did a study mm -hmm. uh, just recently about income and health, and we'll show this slide that shows that, you know, if you're below thirty-five thousand dollars in terms of income, you have two and a half times the chance of developing diabetes, type two diabetes, than if you have an income above that. Explain what we're, we're this this little chart. Okay, so we did a study and looked at Minnesota data specifically and published this report, income, employment, and diabetes in, in Minnesota, just in in the last few months, and uh, the analysis of the data showed that eight percent of adults as we know, report having diabetes, but the, the spread is not equal across income brackets. So 
working age adults living in households with incomes less than 35,000, two and a half times the rate of diabetes, as you said. So those in, 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 with incomes higher than 35,000 for their household um, have, have less diabetes. So we don't really know what is the cause of that. It could be that having low incomes, um, maybe needing to work more, having less time to cook, maybe less access to healthy foods, more access to fast foods, all of those things um, can contribute as well as do people with lower incomes have as, many ac as much access to um, health, um, safe and you know, places to be active? Do they have time in their days for that? So those things can increase obesity, which then can increase uh, diabetes. Or it could also be that having diabetes reduces your income. Um, we do know that people with diabetes are more than two times as likely than their counterparts to be unemployed. We know that they are more likely to leave the workforce, retire early. Um, so, you know, what we do know is that diabetes and low income disproportionately occur together. Yeah. And, and which is the chicken, which is the really egg, we don't understand really understand exactly. But it, but it may also explain some of the racial differences because mm -hmm. people of color in American Indians are disproportionately represented in these lower income populations. So this might right. be part of the, the reason why. That picture, yeah. yep. All right, well I want to talk about, you know, what do we do about this in this last part of our show, but first we need to take another little break. All right. We'll be back right after this message. Marie, you have prediabetes. Prediabetes? I don't have time to eat, write, or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes, and way over here, busy moms. No? Welcome back. We're talking about diabetes in Minnesota with Gretchen Taylor from the Minnesota Department of Health. Gretchen, I know that you had mentioned type 1 diabetes, you need insulin, and it's a treatment, and it's, it's really, we don't know about how to prevent type 1 diabetes. It, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it, but it's not one of those things that we consider as preventable. But type 2 diabetes, you've mentioned multiple times, it's preventable because you talked about the risk factors, obesity and inactivity and diet. And so what's the strategy to try to reduce the number of people with prediabetes and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and what do we do to intervene with the ones who actually have it? So okay. What's going on? Well, fortunately, there is a solution. There, there is a really good solution for people who have prediabetes, and that is to lose 5 to 7 percent of their body weight, um, which for a person of about 200 pounds, that's you know 10 to 15 pounds. It's not People don't need to lose 30 pounds or 60 pounds, most, pe most people. Um, and to increase the physical activity to 150 minutes a week. So 30 minutes, five days a week. Pretty doable um, solutions. But we know that it's difficult to lose weight. And people do need support and education a lot of times and habit building and skill building. So. Uh, the, the great news is that there is a program called the Diabetes Prevention Program. It's been extensively researched to um, show that with um, diet change and physical activity change, uh, people can lose 5 to 7 percent of their body weight and substantially really cut their risk of developing type 2 diabetes over a three-year period in half, more than in mm -hmm. half. So. That's really great. People who are over um, 60, the research study showed, reduced their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 71%. So it's even wow. more uh, effective in people who are somewhat older. Um, and this, it was effective across all races. A large-scale research study was conducted in 
uh, and published in the early 2000s. Um, 3,000 people were involved in 27 centers across the country. It was a clinical trial where they enrolled about 1,000 people in making lifestyle change. 1,000 people got the drug metformin, which is a diabetes drug, and 1,000 people got uh, placebo, roughly those that breakdown. And the people who were in the lifestyle change group were uh, met once a, a week for 16 weeks with a dietitian or a diabetes educator or physician who helped them make the dietary and physical activity changes. And then for eight months after that, they met monthly so that they um, were able to sustain the weight loss. Well, and, and that's where those results come mm. from of the 58% reduction compared to the, the metformin, which was about a 30% reduction compared to the placebo. So lifestyle was the most effective intervention, even compared to a medication. But, you know, doing that one-on-one, -on -one, we, we can't do that one-on-one -on -one with 1 1.6 million adults in Minnesota having prediabetes. So um, then they translated that basically into a group setting. It can be led by a non-health professional who's trained, but still meeting 16 weekly sessions, eight monthly sessions, and there's also been a program uh, that is developed, several of them, to do this online. So, um, and we've been able to see that people can get the same results, five mm. to seven percent weight loss. So that's a much less expensive and we're, you know, more efficient way to uh, help people achieve those same results of, of uh, healthier eating and increase physical activity. Yeah, so it's, it sounds like it's a simple program, not necessarily an easy program, because losing right. weight is not easy. It, you know, it's, it's a simple idea. But right. who has access to this diabetes prevention program? Okay, well, um, CDC supports all of the states in the nation. There's a program called the National Diabetes Prevention Program, and the goal nationally is for all states to make this program available statewide. And so in Minnesota, we've been focusing on getting reimbursement for the program because it really needs to be not only available, but also financially and culturally accessible for people with prediabetes. So um, we've been focusing on getting payment for it and uh, getting it to be a covered benefit for employees or, and, and to be a benefit for people on public programs like Medicaid. So state so, employees- so is, so is it uncovered by Medicaid? In Minnesota, and Minnesota is one of only two states in the nation that is now making the DPP available and something that can be paid for for people on Medicaid fee for service, and now Medicaid is working on those covered in uh, through managed care. Mm -hmm. So Minnesota is a trailblazer in that regard, and yeah. we're, we're very fortunate. Right, well, this is important since the low-income folks who are on, on medical assistance are the ones who are more at greatest risk for developing diabetes. Absolutely, right. So. And so we've, we've learned a lot, and we've done a study offering the program to people on Medicaid and found that we can a achieve weight loss and reduce their risk, and um, that we also learn things that we need, you know, trained lifestyle coaches that are American Indian and African American and speak Somali and Hmong and Spanish, you know, in order to really most effectively reach that population. Right. And I know some employers have offered it. I know this, the state of Minnesota as the largest employer in the state offered it, and, and you said they've lost a, a, quite a bit of weight. Right, over 5,000 uh, state employees participated in the program in the first years. It's been offered since April of 2015, and in that first year, over 43,000 pounds have been lost by those uh, over 5,000 state employees. So it's really, um, been very, very successful, and the employees really have appreciated having this as a covered benefit. Yeah. Well, in the last minute or so that we have, you know, what, what should people do who are watching this program? What can they do on an individual level to prevent their risk of diabetes? Well, first of all, um, get your blood glucose tested. If you're over 45, you definitely need to have it tested. If you're from a population of color, you probably need to be tested earlier, both to diagnose prediabetes, but also there's 25% of people with diabetes who don't know it and they need treatment. Um, so go in, ask to be tested. If you have prediabetes, take it seriously. Um, take diabetes very seriously. 
we want to avoid the moving into the diabetes range, and then we want to avoid those complications. Mm -hmm. And also get some exercise. Get off, the, get off the couch. We've got a beautiful estate. Get some exercise. Eat well. You know, really pay attention to uh, what happens to most of us is that creeping up of the pounds over time. Uh, try to slow that. And if you do have prediabetes, ask your employer, do you cover the DPP? The Y offers it. There are a lot of uh, Minnesota Extension offers it. So there are a lot of places in the state you can have access. Go to our MDH website, um, www.health.state.min.us, M-N-U-S, and slash diabetes, and you can find out and where we'll, the program is. We'll put that on the, that last little bump. Gretchen, okay. thank you. Thank you for being with us. This is very helpful. You're welcome, Good. Commissioner. And thanks, thanks for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. And I'll be back for the closing comment right after this message. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But you probably won't. You're busy. Kids, work, show coming back in 48 seconds. So let's do this now. Hold up one finger if you're a man, women, zero. Three more fingers if you're over 60, two over 50, one over 40. If you're not sure, keep in mind you're sitting on a couch right now. So one more finger if you're not very active. One finger if yes, zero if no. One yes, zero no. Next. Find the body type that looks most like you and hold up that many fingers while I look around awkwardly. And that's it. If you're holding up five fingers or more, you probably have prediabetes. Sorry to be so blunt, but hey, you're busy. Just go to the site. Type 2 diabetes is not an equal opportunity disease. Diabetes disproportionately impacts some racial and ethnic groups, older adults, people who are overweight and obese, and people with low levels of physical activity. Diabetes is also particularly devastating to people with low incomes. A 2016 report from my department found that in Minnesota, working age adults living in households that earn less than $35,000 a year are two and a half times more likely to report having diabetes as those with incomes higher than $35,000. Now in addition, people with diabetes are more than two times as likely to be unemployed and working age adults with diabetes are more likely to exit the workforce, retire early and to have less earnings than their counterparts without diabetes. It is clear that income affects diabetes and diabetes affects income. That means that diabetes is much more than just a health issue. It's an economic issue. That's why if we're going to be effectively addressing this major public health problem, we as public health workers are going to have to deal with non-traditional issues like minimum and living wage, paid sick leave, and overall economic security. Having a strong economy where everyone has the opportunity to thrive economically is a major public health goal that fits in exactly with the Institute of Medicine's definition of public health what we do to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. Getting people out of poverty is one of the ways to assure those conditions, and lowering the rates of diabetes would be one of the end results. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on A Public Health Journal.